Welcome to the Software People Stories. I'm Shiv. I'm Chitra. And I'm Gayatri. We bring you interesting untold stories of people associated with the creation or consumption of software-based solutions. You'll hear stories of what worked and sometimes what didn't. You will also hear very personal experiences and insights that would trigger your thoughts and inspire you to do even greater things. Today, I'm in conversation with Scott Ford, the co-founder and CTO of Corgi Bytes, a company focused on modernizing legacy code. It was partly a conversation that took me to my nostalgia, as well as a lot of learning in terms of the potential of legacy code even today. In this conversation, Scott shares how he found his interest in legacy code after about 10 years of working in various roles and organizations, starting with assignments of fixing bugs, simple ones, and later a little more complex ones. And after addressing them well, taking on more responsibilities, but discovering that his joy was more in fixing code or refactoring more than just writing new features. How he had his trigger moment while watching a PBS show on home improvement called This Old House that gave due credit to the earlier architects and designers and respected their decisions rather than calling the old work as bad or stupid while adding new functionality to something that may not have been thought of in the original design and applying the same principles to modernizing old software. He also shares how he navigates and understands documentation or many times the lack of it for old code and how documentation is best recorded after an experiment is conducted when writing code experimentally and incrementally. He likens modernization of code to the way an archaeologist uncovers and understands what was there and reconstructs the entire context. We talk about some of the changing patterns that he has seen over the years and he talks about two of them. One, the flipping back and forth between static and dynamically typed languages and the approach of centralization and decentralization in creating large systems. He talks about how he leverages his strength of being a polyglot among computer languages by actually working on real-world problems using these languages. For more of what Scott shared, listen on. Hi, Scott. Welcome to the Software People Stories. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, when uh, your colleague initially introduced you and suggested that you could be a guest, I was intrigued and very curious, oh, okay. you know, to find someone who is fascinated by you know, legacy code. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, I, I, I am absolutely fascinated by it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So maybe before uh, getting into that, uh, we could start with your origin story, you know, how you, you know, came to be associated with IT and in particular in the legacy code or if there's something more that probably you know that uh, you know would be of interest for people to understand uh, know you better yeah I think I didn't like I didn't like you know uh, enter university or leave even leave university going oh this is what I want to do this is these are the kind of projects that I want to work on um it was more a it was after years of, of working and moving from job to job and, um, you know, working, working at a company for say six months and getting bored and wanting to leave or getting frustrated and wanting to leave after just, you know, six to nine months. Um, it was after years of, of that, uh, almost 10 years of that, that I reflected back yeah. and, and was like, you know, you know, why, why did I, why did I do that? And this was something that my, uh, my my wife and business partner helped me helped me kind of examine examine that journey and like you know if I wanted to attract projects that I enjoyed working on right mm-hmm. what was it about the places that I worked at that I, I liked about them right oh, yes. so I, I did I I bounced around a lot you know I, uh, I I went to university I I I worked as an intern while I was in university uh, and and worked. Uh, uh, I worked full-time during the summer and then part-time during the school year. So I worked, you know, probably about 
20, 30 hours a week while I was in school uh, and was working on, you know, shipping production software and, and parts of an app, parts of the uh, application ecosystem that I was working in that weren't huge, weren't super high priority or didn't have, you know, weren't super critical. They're the kinds of things that you would give an intern, uh, but still things that people were actually using. And at first I really liked that. I liked that, that discovery and of like, oh, here's something that I didn't work on. Uh, let me figure out how it works so that I can solve problems that people have pointed out. And so, you know, the, the typical problem that was handed to somebody new, and I think this is the case on many projects, the, you, you, you give the new person an easy bug, uh, you, you, you give the new person a bug that's probably easy to fix. Okay. And, and I would go and, and find that and fix it and just really enjoy that and be like, okay, where's the, what's the next bug? And so I would be given a slightly harder bug and then a slightly harder bug and a slightly harder bug. And then I reached this, to me, a magical point. You know, I wasn't able to, uh, you know, because I wasn't one of the people who was managing the, the, the project, I didn't kind of understand when they thought I reached the threshold where they now thought I knew enough that I could I could work on adding features, you know, cr creating the kind of value that that they thought was important. And when it shifted to that, I wasn't having as much fun anymore. Mm. <laughs> like... I was having a lot more fun fixing the bugs. Mm -hmm. I was having a lot more fun refactoring or adding tests or, you know, doing, doing, you know, maintenance and maintenance activities. And I would try to advocate for doing those while doing feature work. Uh, and I would be told like, no, that's not, that's not what you're here for. Um, you know, while you're doing feature work, you shouldn't be refactoring or while you're doing feature work, you shouldn't be fixing bugs or, you know, I'll be like, well, I, I, can, I can do both, right? I'm finding bugs while I'm doing the feature work. I could fix them while I, you know, when I find them, it's like, mm -hmm. no, create an issue and somebody else will, you know, the next intern or whatever will, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the next intern will fix the bug. Your job is just to, just to implement the feature. And it, it felt, it felt so limiting and it felt like, you know, the, the parts of the project that I really liked working, I wasn't allowed to, to work on anymore. And so that's when I started looking for another job. Um, and it took, it took a long time to figure out that this was my pattern, right? That, that that's what I enjoyed working on. And it wasn't until I was watching a, a home improvement show that airs on uh, a PBS in the U S called uh, this old house mm -hmm. where it take an old house as the, the name of the show might, <laughs> might, might clue you in on, uh, they take an old house and they, you know, make it better in some way. Like they'll, hmm. I don't know, um, add a new, uh, add a new room or they'll replace the kitchen or, uh, maybe do both of those things. Right. Uh, but while they were working on those houses, they would also point out things that had been done by the people who came before them that were done well. Mm -hmm. And they just seem to have a lot of care and for, the people who came before them. And it wasn't a, like I had seen other home improvement shows where people would come into an existing structure and say, Oh my gosh, the people who people were here, what were they thinking? Like, you know, they never should have, they never should have built it this way. Like, uh, you know, this is a nightmare. Whereas on this old house, it was, you know, they would see something that's problematic and they would say, like, they would say, well, this is how it used to be done. Or, mm -hmm this is how somebody who, who didn't have a lot of knowledge mm -hmm. would have done this, or this is how somebody who was trying to, um, who was trying to save money w would have done this. And, and, but, you know, but it didn't, it didn't last. Right. And so they would, they would point out the pitfalls of, of that choice, but they didn't never once did I feel like they said that the people who did that work were stupid or idiots or anything like that. Right. And so I was watching that show and I'm like, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. And my wife and business partner was sitting next to me and she was like, you want to quit your job and renovate houses for a living? And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> what they're doing for houses, I want to do for software. Like I want to come in and notice, notice the ways that things could be better and, and make them better and do so while adding value to, to the, to the building. So like they would, uh, or to the software system. <laughs> so like, you know, they would be making, making the house do something that it didn't do before. Like, you know, um, be able to entertain a large number of people or be able to, 
uh, have uh, an office for the people who live there or be able to be able to be more energy efficient during the during the cold winters right like you know there was a there was a reason that they were in there making improvements and while they did so they they would clean up other things that they found along the way mm. so you know oftentimes they would find uh mold or mildew right and they're like we got to clean this up and so i'm like like and it wasn't a uh oh you can just leave this for later it was a this really should be taken care of now because we've noticed it um and the one activity didn't at least in the show like it, there may have been behind the scenes conversations with the homeowners and, and budgets and whatnot uh but at least what they presented on tv it, there didn't seem to be a conversation about you can't have both mm -hmm. right you can't have this new addition on your home and fix these problems we found you mm -hmm. can't you know it was like no we can do both and we will do both and like so that's that's what's got me excited and so i was like well if I only want to work on those kinds of projects, then one way to force that to happen is to uh, create a create a company that only accepts that kind of work. Mm -hmm. and, and so it like that kind of became a forcing function and that you know the only clients that we'll have will be ones who are interested in that kind of help. And then I won't have to go from you know job interview to job interview to job interview <laughs> to try to find a place to work. those uh, those code bases can come to me. was kind of the idea. Yeah, that's a great story and a very amazing metaphor, you know, to equate it to house renovation. You kind of partially answer the question that crossed my mind as you were uh, explaining it. Uh, how do you deal with either the lack of documentation or a different style of documentation that might have been used when the original code was written? Yeah, that I mean, that happens all the time. I think it's only natural that when we're creating something new, and especially if it's still considered experimental like experimental is still considered experimental by the organization that we're creating it for mm. nobody knows if it's going to be successful nobody knows if it's going to work so there is less uh, motivation to put energy into certain kinds of activities there's less motivation to put energy into making sure it's well documented there's less energy put into making sure it's well tested. The question that is most important is, will it work? Will it solve the problem? And, and so what I think often happens is the answer to that is either no, and the project gets discarded and we don't really see those, right? Those, we don't, we don't see those projects get left around because they, they've been deleted. Or the answer is yes. And then there's eagerness to make it better. There's eagerness to make it do more. Mm. And I think, uh, I think teams get kind of wrapped up in that eagerness and organizations get wrapped up in that eagerness of like, okay, we've kind of, we validated the idea, this will work. And then they don't like, that would be a great time to kind of document their understanding. That would be a great mm. time to kind of pay down a little bit, of the, a little bit of the technical debt that they built mm. up to, mm. you know, to kind of answer the question, to kind of complete the experiment. Right. It's almost like if you think about it in terms of an experiment, a lot of teams are skipping this step where they document their findings. <laughs> and so what we end up having to do when we inherit a system like that, where we're asked to work on it, is try to figure out what experiment was being conducted and what evidence do we see of their results. And that is kind of the, the documentation that we have end up having to piece together. Mm -hmm. And often it's not just one experiment. It's mm -hmm. layers upon layers of experiments. And we end up having to guess at the motivations for conducting the experiment in the first place. And we end up having to guess at um, what the results were. And hopefully we guess right. <laughs> and we can we can document those guesses. We, we, we can document what we think uh, it was as we, as we figure those things out. We can document them in executable forms, uh, in the forms of tests or scripts to set up the environment or, you know, things of that sort. Uh, we can also document them in... Uh, you know, diagrams, even better would be a diagram that's generated from the code itself so that it doesn't, it's not going to lie in the future, uh, things like that. But creating mechanisms to help increase the understanding of those who come after us. So it's, it's a little bit like I've never chatted with an archaeologist, but I, I imagine mm -hmm. <laughs> that the, the process is probably similar of you have remnants of people who were 
uh, who came before you and you don't have the ability to talk to them. You don't have the ability to ask them questions. So you have to make guesses based on what you see and, and just acknowledge their guesses and you're, you're not going to know and uh, be okay with that uncertainty and then just do your best. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you would consider yourself more of a detective or a mind reader. When you have these missing pieces or you have to guess the intent of why something was... The reason is, uh, I remember you know, working on uh, some piece of code where uh, it was for a, a junior college. And they said, yeah, just we need this small change to be done. And uh, this was the registration system where students come and choose the different courses. And uh, that was a peak time. They had to handle peak load. So the choices were made. And then the system is supposed to compare and see if there are any clashes in the schedules and if these are courses allowed, et cetera, and then say that you know, it'll work or not work. And then the student can either you know, drop something or choose something else and all that. Right. Now, this had to run. And when I looked at the code, it was just about three lines of code written in Algol. Okay. okay. And what they were doing were two things. Now, one was that um, all this was maintained as bits in the data structure. It is not just in the code. Okay. And the second is this would be called recursively. And every time you add a course, it'll do that. It'll uh, XOR the bitmap and then boom, it's it's already there. Okay. Okay. But then it took me a while to figure out you know, that it was being called recursively or you know, they look at the data structure and see you know, how is all this information maintained in just this in a few bytes. You know, in those days, you know, every, yeah, bit, few every bytes, bite was yeah. bytes really every every bit mattered. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So it took me a while to understand uh, the thought behind that whole structure. Obviously, there was no documentation. Right? Mm -hmm. So I was thinking of similar things. When you get in, uh, now how do you understand you know, the thought process that would have gone in? Because we also see changes in either architecture patterns or design patterns, something that become popular mm -hmm. at one time and maybe you know, it kind of shifts. I imagine that if if there's anyone out there who is... Who, who who inherited um, some of the systems that I worked on after I discovered the Gang of Four Patterns book? Then they might be why they might be wondering why everything is a singleton and everything is a command. Everything else is a command, right? Um, because I found those two patterns to be fascinating and mm -hmm. um, started viewing a lot of the problems that were in front of me as problems that could be decomposed in that way, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I perhaps overused those patterns. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, I think I, when I'm looking at, when I'm looking at code, I, I wonder about that as well. I think probably more, probably more detective, but I think, I think I, I, I imagine a good detective has to be a mind reader as well, mm -hmm. but really trying to think about what might this person have been used to doing, right? Like mm -hmm. I I've seen like bits and pieces of code that's written in Ruby where, you know, lots of Ruby projects, you know, for let's say an e-commerce website, there, there's not a lot of stress about memory management, mm -hmm. but every now and then you'll come across an app where you can tell that a lot of care and attention was put into like cramming as much information into a single variable or a single data structure as possible. Mm -hmm. And so I find myself wondering, I'm like, I wonder if this person's background is in C, or I wonder if this person's background uh, is mm -hmm. from a language and, you know, where they were originally taught was from a language environment where, you know, they were responsible for managing memory and mm -hmm. they, they really cared about these things. And then mm -hmm. it's almost like that kind of leaves a fingerprint on the way mm -hmm. problems are solved. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if it seems like every single problem is solved with a recursive solution, then I wonder if like, oh, you know, this person's background is in, you know, maybe a uh, scheme or, or Lisp where they're used to solving things recursively. And <laughs> yeah. So I start to I start to you know kind of kind of wonder about that, and so like in the example that that you put forward, like it could be like somebody who's used to doing and you know working with embedded systems where, you know, the computer only had so much memory available, and they had to they had to figure out how to how to you know make the most of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, another thing. That, so I've been guilty of this. So I'm not I'm not trying to disparage people. I've also noticed in my past, like not only have I over engineered systems, so I've like, you know, uh, I've built a way more complicated solution that was necessary because I thought that's what would be required. But I, mm -hmm. you know, in hindsight, I was wrong. But at the time I was, you know, doing my best, but there have been other times where I was bored. Mm -hmm. 
And that I think that boredom sometimes leads to solutions that we think might work, but are probably not necessary. Right. There, there, there would be a simpler way to do it, but you're, I think some people have described it as trying to be clever. Um, but I think it's more like, uh, being curious about whether or not a certain approach will even work. And so you end up trying it just because you're curious. Uh, and, and I think, I think boredom can come into that as well. It was like the, 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 the naive solution just seems too easy and isn't very interesting. And as a way to try to spice up your work and, and make it, make your work more exciting, yeah. Uh, you, you end up adding complexity into it. And I think, I think a lot of people do this unintentionally, or it'll be like, you write an article about a cool library and you think like, oh, this, this library might, might solve this problem, okay. even though that, that library might actually be making things more complicated than, than it, it otherwise would need to be. But I've been guilty of that too. So do you see any shifts in patterns of programming over the years, maybe generations or maybe the the fads that might be there from time to time, client server, object oriented, service oriented, microservices, and all kinds of things that you keep hearing. Yeah, I think I've seen a flip back and forth between compiled, not so much compiled, but more, I would say like statically typed and dynamically typed. Mm -hmm. And I feel like both have pros and both have cons, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there are language ecosystems that completely embrace either one approach or the other. And I feel like what I've noticed over the years, and I've seen, I feel like I've seen this flip back and forth a couple of times, you'll have a, a large percentage of the population of people who are working in software who are working in either uh, statically typed languages or dynamically typed languages, pick one as a starting point, but that's all they've known, right? Mm -hmm. That's where they started their career. That's what they learned in university. They're frustrated with bumping up against the problems that appear uh, in that, in that, you know, when you're solving problems in that only solve, solving problems with only that tool. So then they discover, you know, the opposite. So if they're working with dynamic all the time, then they discover, they, they start to wonder what it would look like if they're working with static types. If they've been working with just static types all, 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 all the time, they start to wonder what it would look like if they had, you know, more dynamic types. Mm -hmm. And then, so they enthusiastically just switch and think that's going to solve all their problems. But it's more they haven't discovered the problems over there yet, right? Like it's there are problems over there too. So, uh, like, and so I think that's a a pendulum back and forth that I've seen at least come around once or twice now. So with like, you know, static typing and having the compiler tell you, uh, you know, the the compiler can help you avoid whole classes of bugs if if you let it, right? With with static typing because the compiler knows about the types and it can solve all those problems. Um, but then it can be difficult to write in certain kinds of algorithms, or you might find yourself writing the same code over and over and over and over again, because the compiler won't let you be, uh, the compiler won't, doesn't provide you with mechanisms to, you know, uh, define an algorithm once and then reuse it in multiple places. Whereas that kind of problem is a lot easier in a dynamic, uh, mm -hmm. context, or, um, you may feel that you want to do a little bit of metaprogramming where like you, you kind of wish you could extend the language that you're working with. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something that's a lot easier to do in a lot of the dynamic, dynamically typed languages, you know, you end up <clears throat> jumping over there. But then if you're working in a dynamically typed language all the time, you can end up, end up in situations where you know, you're trying to interact with an object you, you, you don't, because you don't know what the type is, you're just having to assume that it knows how to respond to the messages that you're sending to it or the, or the, the ways that it's being invoked. Um, and so you end up having to write a lot of code to, to check that, or you have to write a lot of tests to, to validate that. Uh, and so you get frustrated with that and you wish that there was a tool that, that could solve that for you up front and like, and you rediscover the compiler and the compiler can do that for you. If you added, if you added uh, type checking. Um, so I feel like this, this kind of back and forth has happened a couple of times. Um, Another theme that I've seen uh, is uh, centralization and decentralization. Mm. Uh, so I feel like, you know, the mainframe was the ultimate centralization. And then the uh, uh, recognizing that the, with, with the introduction of the, of the PC, that, you know, sitting on everybody's desk was a computer that could do computations also. So like shifting the computations out to the, out to that edge. So not having the mainframe do all the computations, but 
uh, allowing the, the PCs on everybody's desk to do some computations. And to some extent, that got taken too far, right? Where every <laughs> every PC is is doing all the work. And then so I feel like that then kind of flipped back a little bit with monolithic websites. And then it started to flip back again to a more distributed approach with having the computer do, uh, having the client do some of the work with, you know, uh, in, in the browser with JavaScript. So you have these like rich client applications and the, the HTTP server is, is relatively dumb and doesn't really have much of the logic built into it. You know, all the information for how to do the processing is is running in the browser on the on the consumer's desktop, uh, and I think now you're starting to see that shift back again uh, with the introduction of like you know, lambda functions and, and things like that, where uh, there is a little bit more of this uh, centralization of computing power, uh, and I expect it'll it'll shift back again eventually. <laughs> but but yeah, so I think I think those are two those are two themes that I've seen where like things kind of like kind of flip back and forth. Um, yeah, the related thing is I noticed that your website describes you as a polyglot. Yeah. And you also talked about each language having its own characteristic or certain types of behavior. Uh, so how do you manage, in a way, the transition between working on multiple languages, multiple projects, and uh, retain another context and make sure that uh, whatever is in legacy, the intent is not missed? So I try to enmesh myself in like in different language ecosystems and get get experience like actually shipping production code in each of them mm -hmm. so that it's it's not just an academic understanding it's a like mm -hmm. I've worked through the challenges of you know solving the problems in this language ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Um so 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 I I so I think that's part of it. So like for all the languages that I've worked with over the years like um uh Delphi, C# -sharp, uh C++, C, PHP, um, Ruby, Python, uh, Go, um, Java, Kotlin here recently, you know, it's still in the Java ecosystem, but a different language, really trying to like get practice with, with using it, uh, mm -hmm. on a, on a real world, real world problem. And, um, and I think that has really helped kind of see the patterns and, uh, benefits of, uh, of different approaches. And so I'll often find myself like working in, in, uh, let's say that I'm working in Ruby and there's a, or I'm not working in Ruby rather, let's say I'm working in, working in C sharp and there is a, a testing technique that I'm used to from Ruby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm wishing that that testing technique existed, mm -hmm. existed in .NET. And sometimes people have created it. So you'll have these, the inspirations cross language ecosystem boundaries. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's not there, so you end up having to like create a facsimile, or you know, you figure out some way to kind of implement it, implement it yourself. Uh, and I think that's where some of the kind of the innovation and creativity can come in as well is recognizing how something was done in one language ecosystem, and uh, if you find yourself working in, in a different one that doesn't have that capability, then you can create it. Like it's a way to kind of uh, you know, innovate, even though if you might be working on an older project. You can uh, create some innovation with uh, bridging new techniques and old techniques. So you know there might be a language eco there might be a language ecosystem that uh, moves much more quickly in terms of like the speed of innovation or the introduction of new ideas or new experiments. I think JavaScript is the JavaScript ecosystem right now is one that's just moving very very rapidly. And so you can draw inspiration for the language ecosystem that you're working in from kind of paying attention to what's going on over there. So uh, I read a lot of blogs. Uh, from different language ecosystems, I try to keep up with what's going on with the development of of different languages and and uh, different tooling around around the different languages. I try to see what libraries are coming out, which which ones uh, solve different problems. There are some polyglot uh, news sources for that that mm -hmm. for people who want to to stay up on that can follow. I think the uh, the change log uh, podcast and and blog is. Uh, is is a great one to follow. They you know okay. they cover open source uh, technologies, but they do so in a very uh, a very polyglot way. So it's you know mm -hmm. you know all of the all, all of the languages get get, get equal attention. I also think that uh, InfoQ does a really good job of being a very kind of polyglot news source. I feel like they have a little bit more of an enterprise focus in their in their coverage. But I think you know for the the kinds of projects that I've been working on recently, that's actually okay. <laughs> Uh, even though I might not be working on a Java project, you know, I'll see them come out with a news article about, 
you know, things that are new in the latest version of Java or mm -hmm. things that are new in the latest version of say spring or spring boot. Um, and, uh, so I, you know, read that and try to commit some of it to memory. And then a few months from now, when I happen to be on a Java project, I'll remember that and, <laughs> yeah, uh, amazing. and then tr tr try to go back for it. Yeah. Amazing. I want to segue a little bit moving yeah. away from the, the deep technology aspects that you've been talking about uh, into the, the business side. Mm -hmm. So when did you feel that there was a business or there can be a company that works in this? By the way, I think we did not uh, spend time in introducing you know, Corgi Bytes as to what Corgi Bytes does. So maybe if you can also share yeah. the focus of yeah, Corgi so Bytes. And yeah. yeah, so Corgi Bytes is a consultancy that... Um, uh, exclusively helps companies with the software systems they already have. With that, we conclude today's conversation, but we continue with how he got bitten by the startup bug and his experience and thoughts related to creating and running a business as an entrepreneur. Do listen on next week. We thank Siddharth for the music and Anita for promoting the software people stories. If you like this episode, please subscribe on your favorite podcast client and spread the word in your network. If you'd like to share your story, contact us at podcasts at pm-powerconsulting.com.